Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Driving Open Collaboration Through Joint Solutioning panel discussion for the Hyperledger Global Forum. My name is Nancy Min. I'm the founder of Ecolong and the chair of the Hyperledger Social Impact Special Interest Group, and I will be the moderator of the session. As you all are aware, uh, di distributed ledger technology holds significant potential to deliver benefits for humanitarian aid, development, and civil society institutions in general. We're really excited to have you join us as our panel will go over ways that we will use the open and collaborative nature of DLTs to unlock social good. We will explore some different various use cases, barriers to innovation and sustainment issues of the social good economy. The purpose of this discussion is to really spur innovation, tackle never before addressed issues and serve as a launching pad for future innovation. As part of the session, we'll cover three main sections. Uh, the first one will cover industry trends, uh, the second one we'll discuss is governance frameworks and also end on open questions. So if you have any questions that you would like for the panelists to answer, please drop them in the Q&A chat box. So that should be available for everyone. And finally, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our panelists for this session. Each panelist will introduce themselves, please, and give an overview of their work and potentially also highlight some of the innovative projects that they, they've been working on. So, Mark, I will actually have you start. Okay, thank you very much, Nancy. And uh, good morning and good afternoon, good evening to those wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Mark Liberati. Uh, I work for United Nations Volunteers Program, a former UN volunteer myself. Uh, I'm currently the Policy Pillar team lead and, and also had been participating in our AI blockchain big data working group for our digital transformation project. I also sit in uh, a member of Young UN, which is in uh, sort of an informal affiliation of uh, change makers inside the United Nations system. And I'm vice team lead for policy uh, in the ITU working group uh, called Digital Currency Global Initiative, working on uh, competition, consumer protection, and dispute resolution. I'm very glad to be here. And also, I might touch upon a recent white paper working on in Team Unicoins, uh, which was part of the Reimagine UN Challenge. Uh, which is looking at a time-based um, token for uh, collaboration uh, for the SDGs internal to the UN system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. Really looking forward to learning more about the Unicoin project. Um, Alicia, uh, can you also? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alicia Noel, and I founded a company called Cultivati. I do research consulting and education related technology and innovation, mostly in the food and agricultural supply chain space. Um, I'm also vice chair of the social impact SIG at Hyperledger, as well as the D-Lab blockchain accelerator and several other groups. I'm looking forward to this discussion and um, hopefully bringing in some examples of use cases and how they're the questions and also um, ways that the technology is being leveraged to have impact in a variety of ways. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. Hey, Sean. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Wilborn. I am the co-founder of Lid Vision. Uh, our focus is really in the waste and recycling space. Um, and, you know, we really, we, re we originally started off with uh, d developing some technology, computer vision, and, and now we really, we, we're, we're incorporating some uh, technology as well. Uh, so look forward to uh, discussing some trash with anyone if, if you're interested. I'm also in on the Miami Climate Alliance uh, on their steering committee um, as well. So uh, typically I'm out of Miami right now. I'm currently at my uh, my grandparents' house. So I'm in Idaho uh, uh, tuning in from the West Coast. Um, and then, you know, other than that, you know, I've been involved with the social impact group for a little over a year now, uh, we've been working on some blogs in the circular economy space. So we'll, we'll dive into that in a little bit. But uh, when, it, when it comes to waste and recycling, you know, that's really that's really my jam. So uh, any questions in that realm, feel free to shoot them over. Keyshawn, so we have um, with us a panelist that really cover kind of the full breadth um, of social impact and social good. So it's very exciting. Um, just to kind of start off a little bit um, of the conversation around these various industry trends. So, you know, I kind of wanted to propose an open question. So what are some of the industry trends and in thinking about ag, circular economy, and some of the stuff that you guys are working on, you know, CBDC or United Nations, like 
that are really driving blockchain technology adoption um, in your respective fields? In culture, I'd say the use that I'm seeing blockchain being used for the most is around traceability, so track and trace initiatives that allow different stakeholders to know where food is coming from, who the different players were involved. Some of these make that information transparent to consumers as well. Some are really only involved. So that's where the majority of blockchain uses I see are. And also there are cases like Hara token out of Indonesia that is using blockchain with GPS and other technologies and partnering with local banks to provide micro loans for smallholder farmers to, so that they can access capital in, in an environment where it's difficult to prove land ownership, where there's not always that record. We're also seeing companies, organizations like Fair Food out of the Netherlands that are working with the to make sure that all of the producers are paid a fair wage, are being paid not that they can live on with dignity. So a lot of different examples and exciting to watch come forward. Yeah, I was just also going to add, I mean, uh, and I was thinking when I first started, I was actually about five years ago asked to sort of join this informal, it's called the UN Blockchain Group. And it was done through the uh, U UNOPS, the Office of Project Services. And they were looking really at, at a very practical problem which is moving cash around. I mean, there have, you know, it's in very hard scrabble places often, and it's very expensive to move cash, often even just for, for salaries or for, for volunteers, it'd be living allowances, um, for humanitarian assistance, and it requires, you know, it's a huge logistical operation, and they were um, excited about that. I think as that, th then that, that involved interview, having discussion with many different actors at the time, and I think it really opened up the eyes to the potential of what this mean, which was much bigger than just uh, payment services. So there is a huge, I mean, there's a proliferation of blockchain solutions that are that are cropping up around uh, different U UN use cases. Um, a well-known one is uh, World Food Program's Building Blocks, which is also looking at this sort of a payment, payment solution. Um, uh, there's a UN Digital ID, which is actually then trying to have an internal um, ID system. Uh, there's the consortium between uh, various UN entities. It's currently between World Food Program, UNDP, and UNICEF, but you can imagine a more decentralized, that leading to sort of a more centralized um, United Nations system. The UN Postal Administration actually is, is issuing an NFT stamp, a crypto stamp, um, and also now they're, they're, I think UNICEF is also accepting uh, crypto to their affiliated offices. So there's, I mean, and, and then that's, that's just the internal, there's also external where they're actually, you know, for example, UNDP is building through their alt finance lab um, solutions for those program countries, such as I think a recent one I saw was called Cedar Coin, where they're using it for traceability of um, replanting trees that then can be uh, GPS location provided. And so the donor knows that that and it's actually attracting the diaspora, Lebanese diaspora population, but it could be open to anyone. Uh, and that's looking to sort of harness financing for the SDGs while giving that a surety. Um, to the uh, to the donors uh, that there that there's no double counting of, of the trees, for example. So I think there's just there's just almost unlimited opportunity, and it's sort of just beginning. So it's a very exciting time to sort of be in this space. Yeah, and um, you know, from from my perspective, it's really focused on the the circular economy again. You know, looking at uh, raw materials, looking at products. So on the on the front side of the supply chain, you're 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 really tracking those materials as they're moving uh, from manufacture to distribution to retail, and then at the point of consumer. So you know, at that that product that you pick up 
from mm -hmm. online? You know, what is its source? You know, are those vendors vetted? You know, what kind of practices do they have uh, from a social perspective as well as an environmental perspective? And then, you know, that's that's the the you know some of some of the front end. And then, you know, really where I'm focused is uh, the reverse side, right? So after you put that material into your recycling bin or you drop it off somewhere at a local recycling center or um, or someone comes by to collect it, you know, what happens to it? And that's where we see a lot more. We see some up and coming innovation in that space to say, hey, you know, I deposited X bottle here. You know, what does that bottle uh, turn into? And can we verify that on the back end to say, hey, no, it didn't go to the landfill. It actually did end up in the recycling center or alternatively, it, uh, it went to the recycling center, but it ultimately ended up as X, Y, Z product right on the back end. Um, so that's that, that's looking at the reverse logistics aspect. And, you know, there are a few uh, there are a few companies in the space that are doing um, uh, food, you know, compost, as well as bottle tracking. Um, and then we're also seeing some impact from a company called Loop and not necessarily uh, focused on blockchain, but they are, you know, looking at reusability, right? So when you have that reusability aspect, then blockchain comes in to say, hey, yes, uh, this person did uh, recycle or did um, have this refillable bottle. It was empty. It was put into to the uh, van or collection vehicle at this time. And then it actually, you know, doesn't necessarily get recycled, but it gets refilled right at a local place and then brought back to the person. So looking at the carbon footprint of that, um, right, and, and having some calculations around it, you know, we, we see blockchain uh, having that value uh, uh, from a transparency perspective. But, you know, more, more importantly, I think when we're talking about reverse logistics, uh, I think that one of the biggest aspects is the carbon footprint, right? How, how long uh, uh, is it traveling? Is it going to China? Is it going to India? Is it going to Bangladesh? You know, back in 2017, 2018, when um, China stopped accepting our materials, a lot of folks, you know, lost faith in our recycling system, uh, but what we're what we're realizing is that yes, you know, we, we need a lot of investment in infrastructure, but you know, how are we going to use innovative technologies to create additional efficiencies that weren't available in the past, right? And so we have these stagnant systems uh, that are currently in place. But we see a lot of opportunity for for growth and also for, uh, uh, you know, deploying innovative technologies to create that transparency. Right. And that's one one key element that blockchain brings. Right. I put I put something in the can. Not sure what happens to it. Well, now we can actually pinpoint where it ends up and we can feed that information back to the uh, that back to the end user who is actually recycling that material. So, you know, um, you know, that's just that's just high level, you know, a couple quick examples. But look forward to uh, to dive in a little deeper as we move forward. Thank you all so much. You know, and I noticed a couple of words that I just wanted to kind of capture for the, the, the audience were, you know, really uh, trust and transparency as being, you know, some key factors in deciding what use cases uh, blockchain makes a lot of sense. And I think, Mark, one thing that you said that really caught my attention was we're just scratching the surface, right? There's just so much potential, I think, with all of these different use cases in different ways. So this kind of leads me to my next question, right? So there's so many opportunities in which blockchain can really be that cutting edge technology and bringing innovation and also bringing more efficiency into different processes. So what are some of the hurdles um, that you guys have seen, you know, as folks are developing out these use cases, what are the hurdles in developing these different types of public private partnerships? And I'm also kind of curious um, on the other end, you know, not only are what are what the hurdles are, but what are some of the steps that you or you know folks that you've you've noticed in this industry have taken to overcome some of these hurdles? Yeah, I, mean, I was just gonna say, I mean, on on the. I mean, first of all, just, I mean, also on circular economy, because we're talking about like open collaboration. I mean, I, you are always looking at other, other inspirations that you can take, take away from and hope you can sort of replicate on that, which also does sort of lower the, lower the barriers. And it is sort of lowering the hurdles because often one of the hurdles is people don't, they, they see it as a very nascent technology and they feel that it's then uh, not fully um, ready uh, for deployment. Or there will be extremely costs, uh, or that the the, the complexity um, will outweigh the, the the benefits. And so, of course, like anything, the, the the early adapters are obviously then 
making that lowering that barrier for everyone. And so I think, I mean, even personally, one of the things that I I really take inspiration from was this Chinese use case, uh, Zhuhui, which was a volunteer platform and it had millions of users. And then they were using the they were taking the hours of the volunteers and tokenizing that to provide a, both you know a certification of the hours that were provided. But through and they also have another a very nice uh, tech stack on the verification process. But then they were able to convert that into an asset that was very um, that drove in the incentives for the for the volunteers. And this was a bit what also did inspire for the for the white paper. So I think I mean, it's it's uh, I I think we're we're coming up sort of the innovation um, the, the it going from the early adopters, and I think it's becoming a bit more. A bit more mainstream, and I think that has ultimately both the lessons learned from those who were who were the early adopters, um, as well as the sort of the, the paths that they blazed, um, have really opened up um, the doors for for organizations that might not um, have the mantra of you know disrupt first, break it, and don't worry about it. And that tends to often be in public public sector organizations or um, more larger incumbents. That might take a more skeptical view for for various good reasons, but I think uh, th those barriers luckily are are falling and falling quickly as the technology both develops, but also use cases are moving more towards scale. And then I think there's a healthy competition and sort of a a desire to also uh, participate meaningfully. And so that's sort of what I wanted to share on that point. <laughs> I when you go ahead. Um, I can I can jump in as well. Um, oh, go ahead, Mark. No, no, please go ahead. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. So so um. Um, the hurdles that we see, you know, I think Mark really had, right? The, the first thing anyone mentions with any type of project is cost, right? How much is going to cost us? What's the maintenance? What's the support going to be like ongoing? And especially when you're talking about a new technology uh, uh, that, you know, people are already hesitant to adopt, you know, it, it, it can be difficult to sort of uh, drive some of the, um, some of the, some of the cost benefits around it, right? Uh, just from, a, um, you know, like, like Nancy said, just from trans, from a transparency perspective, you know, how are we, how are we quantifying the value? of that to an entity when they might not be necessarily concerned with it right so being able to really storytell around uh, um, you know some of the some of the social impact value that's brought to the table but as well as the the cost savings is very important and you know there was a blog that we recently put out um, in, in one example in there, uh, Cripsy was doing a recycling project where they were basically tracking uh, some of the plastic waste that was going into the ocean. And once it gets gets collected, they say, okay, uh, it was actually picked up from this point, right? Uh, this river or whatever it may be. And they can, they, can, they, can, they can then quantify that and then take it back to a brand and say, hey, look, you know, now you can use this uh, recycled material and you can pinpoint the place where you made the impact, right? So that's just like a, a quick example of trying Trying to figure out how can we, um, you know, uh, essentially close the loop on the materials, you know, collect them, but uh, but bring them back uh, and, and put them back into. Yeah, I think Sean's a bit broken at the moment, but question becomes, you know, how do you bear tarps on some of the hurdles with the public-private partnership uh, in in developing those aspects? Because when we look at the the brands and then we look at the government and then we look at the consumer and you see the different moving parts and then you also have the manufacturer in play. Uh, uh, and when, when you have these different entities, they all have their own uh, agendas, right? And so being able to match the benefits uh, to, to each of them to move your project forward, it, it can it can be kind of a challenge, but the, the main focus is, you know, what is driving the, what is your ultimate goal with the project, right? And how are you gonna move it forward? Because it may just be a, a pilot project and and then you've done all this development, and then it goes and sits on the shelf for you know three to five years because uh, uh, it doesn't doesn't get any funding, or you know you, the the story behind it and the benefits behind it weren't um, um, well explained. So that's that that's what I would say as far as a hurdle is you know look at the different agendas that are that are out there and figure out how you can match up your your project with with what the other uh, entities are trying to accomplish. Thank you, Sean. I, I completely agree with everything we just. 
pieces, all these moving parts, and the different organizations do have different priorities, they, they sometimes don't align. It often takes a lot of not just collaboration, but negotiation. In terms of the food and ag space, in different parts, and I'm not just speaking about countries think of as the developing world, I am including G20 nation. A lot of supply chain tracing is still done by paper. A couple of months ago, I had a meeting with the CEO and CTO of a European country for a global grocery chain and discussing track and trace. And they're still doing it. And with, they don't feel the need internally to move over to, digi to digitization. Other countries, things are much more digitized. So it's important to know what is the on the ground environment that you're going into. Certainly in the US with the FDA promoting their new era of smarter food safety, which Frankie Anna spoke about during the keynote on Tuesday, during his keynote, we're seeing a lot more adaptation of these different technologies and we're going to continue to see more adaptation of blockchain and other innovations. And yet sometimes countries or sometimes companies go into environments they don't necessarily understand the ground conditions and whether it be Asia or Latin America or Africa or just a matter of going into Europe or a European company coming to the US. And that's very important because if you don't take that time to understand the environment you're working in, both in terms of infrastructure, roads, telephone systems, internet availability, as well as the legal constraints and what is the legal environment, especially around banking or anything like that, it's going to be really hard to develop something that can be used and that users are, are going to be willing to use and adapt. Thank you, Alicia. Mark, did you want to add something? No, I was just, I mean, Alicia and, and, and Sean both just sparked the thought about um, sort of having that regulatory co-creation or at least uh, really trying to work, I think, closely. I see this often in the working group on, on digital currency where there are some regulatory actors and you and you do then have, um, it's sort of breaking those silos uh, often and, and looking for those forums. And this is, a, I mean, ITU is a nice example because it's a, it's a, it's a, it has a broad stakeholder base. Uh, in that case, I think uh, and even within agencies, I know that uh, when that UNICEF uh, cryptocurrency donation came out, I mean, it, it raised questions around how did they legally structure that? And then the, the legal offices, I think, at least in my own organization, it was the, that was one of the questions I raised, which was thinking around how did they structure that? And does that now open something up that wasn't seen as open up before because they were taking more, you know, out of an abundance of caution? So um, I, I think, you know, I think working closely with, with those state actors, but also looking for um, the innovation points in those in those state actors, I think will also, you know, and identifying that very early on as a strategic partner, I think also makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, Mark, I completely agree. It's always important to have those cheerleaders and, and these driven organization so that there is that internal motivation to move forward. Absolutely love that internal motivation. I think that's a tagline we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna use uh, throughout the discussion. But this is actually a perfect transition into the next question. Um, you know, starting the conversation around governance frameworks and how we can really enable these open collaborations um, across various stakeholders. Right? Sean mentioned you know the different manufacturers, you know the suppliers, and all these distributors and all these different participants within um, various networks. So the question kind of is, you know, how can governance frameworks be designed to ensure that the interests of these network users and all these participants are aligned with each other? And I think you guys touched upon that a little bit, but I want to kind of pull that out a little bit more. From my perspective, and here I'm putting on a hat to work inside of government on technology and would be writing um, RFPs for different type of information management systems, it was critically important that we speak with a lot of different stakeholders, not only the agencies involved, 
the users and also the, the different community groups, everything like that. And I see the same thing when it comes to developing, especially cross-border track and trace systems, whether it be mainly for from a reducing food fraud perspective or more of a environmental impact or social impact, labor issues, it's really important to speak with the different players, understand what, what not only their constraints, but what their concerns are. Because if you, if you understand where they're coming from, why there might be why they might be concerned about having their real name used on something. If you understand that there are re very real public safety or, or physical safety issues in play, it's going to then enable you to design something that will work for them and that they're going to be much more confident around. And when they observe that you are taking their concerns seriously, they're gonna be that much more willing. I've always seen more willingness to come to the table when they see that we are listening to their concerns and trying to figure out how do we make it work for them as well. Alicia, just a kind of uh, follow on question about that, right? Thinking about the ag space, um, especially when you're looking at supply chains that you're dealing with multiple farmers, it potentially, right, as, as a potential way of using it. How do you manage uh, sometimes like the conflicting interests between uh, or the competition, um, so to speak, you know, how, how can you get all of them on board in a system like this um, to really be cooperating with each other? Well, really good question. And the this comes down to what, whom, and is it really competition or competition where there are collaboration competition? A lot of these traceability initiatives, the information is not available to the public. So then you've got a manufacturer who isn't worried that somebody is going to come in and take their suppliers or, or bid higher to their suppliers. Different, different initiatives take very different perspectives on it, depending on the environment they're working in. Um, just a couple of years ago, when Walmart rolled out their um, spinach and salad, salad green initiative, they, they made it mandatory at first that all of the direct suppliers participate. And then a couple months later, anyone going, going, um, anyone supplying one of their suppliers would be participating. So, so it was um, a, a tiered adaptation. But it's mandatory and sometimes that's what it is you don't understand the environment and who holds who holds the power for lack of a better way of explaining that thank you so much yeah i i wanted to jump in i was just thinking more i mean exactly i mean i think alicia's touched upon these these misalignments that can occur and, and then really thinking about how you're trying to then bring i'm currently reading uh eleanor ostrom's governing the commons and uh first female uh, economist to win the nobel peace prize um and um or, well the no, not sorry nobel prize for economics and uh she has these eight principles and it is all about sort of bringing a commons together for community pooled resources but it, it holds a lot of insight when thinking around designing consortium networks and, and trying to align those individual incentives or sort of domain incentives with, with, with the consortium incentives. And that is sort of like how you're really then, and, and she has the, and the apron was quite frankly, on, you know, establishing clear boundaries and having a stake, um, adapting them for the local circumstance. I think Alicia just was touching on that very well. Uh, like the participatory decision-making and having them, um, all those participants have that decision making. There's of course different different approaches you one can take. Clear monitoring and evaluation. I think here blockchain actually does an excellent job in offering um, a, a, a nice way of, uh, in thinking around monitoring and evaluation trails in real time. Graduated sanctions for those that uh, are breaking the rules, or, or and then also having a, a clear and, and universal conflict resolution me mechanism uh, for for dealing with those issues as they may arise. And not also being shy about about conflict. Not all conflict is necessary. It needs to be seen as sort of litigious, um, but also can often be mediated. Um, and then, of course, it, there needs to be sort of an acceptance by the outside 
actors as to what is happening inside. There has to be some sort of uh, sovereignty provided to those consortium. That's of course more of a legal question often. Um, and then I think again, what Alicia was talking about those that nested tiered approach, and then looking at and I and in this book, one of the examples that I love, it, it's the Gal Oya irrigation system in Sri Lanka, and it was the issue of um, you know those who are getting the water. I mean, want to take as much for the, for their farm. They're not as interested in, in those farther down. They're not as interested in helping um, the uh, the irrigation channels be maintained. Um, and and one of the solutions they came up with was well based on all of those principles that I just suggested. But then, quite simply, on the nested side, um, really had these very like field local, uh, like a few farmers in, in a in a consortium, and that was part of a larger consortium. I think this also touches upon Nancy or question at the beginning on how you can sort of um, sort of leverage within something within something bigger and make that more efficient sort of lowering lowering the cost and the barriers uh, so I think that that is sort of I mean one of the inspirations that I've taken away from this book I recommend it because it's uh, it's super insightful um, and uh, it definitely made me think a bit on sort of the design aspects one would have when looking at uh, what are the options when you're trying to make that fit for your purpose. <clears throat> yeah, just to add on, I, I think I uh, knocked that one out of the park. You know, as, far as, uh, as far as sovereignty, as far as and when we're talking about uh, the different players uh, uh, that, are, that are active within it. And I mean, in the the circular economy aspect, just because that's my uh, that's my bread and butter, that's my go-to. Um, when, when we're when we're discussing uh, um, transparency, right, and when we're discussing who is in who who has authority in certain actions, you know, sometimes what we run into is when you uncover something, it can create more issues. So sometimes people like to leave it covered, right? Like so, so you have to be you have to be, we have to be careful in um, sometimes uh, how we present certain things because we could say, yeah, it seems like a great solution, and but once we put X Y Z entity in charge, then you know, all, all, you know, stuff's going to hit the fan. So we don't want to do that. Right. So, so basically, you know, I, I know that's sort of a, um, a kind of a, a, an aside or a tangent, but the, the real point is um, we're going to have to dabble with different authority mechanisms as we move forward. Right. Is the, is the government in charge? Is there some private entity in charge? What's the anonymity on the, the that's going to be required? Uh, what are the privacy concerns that are going to be put forth? Right. And then ultimately if a breach happens, you know, what, what are, what are, what are some of the responses that, that, that are going to, um, that, you know, what's the, what's the response plan. Right. Um, in, in a lot of times when we talk about governments involved with something, consumers run the other way. They're like, Oh, you know, government's in charge of this. Ah, we don't, we don't want it. And it could be, it could be hugely immensely beneficial to them. But just when you say the word government and they're like, Oh, you know, they, they just turn, turn their ears off. Right. So, so we have to, we have to figure out what are, what are these balances that we're going to have to, um, uh, uh, implement and how can we use technology to, to, to not only, balance out uh, uh, these different authoritative mechanisms, but also how can we make sure that we're still uh, telling the story about what it, what are the benefits that are going to be derived from uh, having XYZ entity in charge, or why do we need the government here uh, to support this project, right? So so I think it's, it's really, it really goes back to that um, uh, whole storytelling aspect and making sure that people aren't scared of a technology just because there it has a third, um, you know, it's an open network or something. Or Network, so we don't want to join that or whatever it may be uh, uh, that that, uh, that stirs up. But I think I think Mark and Alicia really really hit those ones. So, Sean, I just want to touch on you raised regarding people being afraid of the technology. One thing I come back to time and time again is that blockchain, kind of like HTML, often it's being used, but you they're using it. Agra Digital out of Australia, one of the founders, gives an example about how they were working in, I want to say Papua New Guinea, that might not be correct, with farmers, and they gave them the handset with the app preloaded and taught them how to use it. You don't need to mention blockchain technology at all. And later, one of the producers came to him and said, I think like use blockchain. Because just like when we use the internet, we don't need to know how to code HTML, but it is there. So um, the technology can seem intimidating, and at the same time, it doesn't need to be. And 
we need to get past that hurdle. Thank you all so much. I think, oh, Mark, please go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I, could, I just couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, obviously I think that is when, you know, when you're first, when you're at the initial trying to explain when we were talking about uh, uh, UNICEF was building this bounties uh, network and there was, a, there was a token and then it even explained to colleagues that you have to get this meta mask, you know, it, it was just too much complexity. No one saw the benefit. And now, you know, you can have these, you can have nested wallets and even in this UN digital ID, it was made originally for, there was a, another version of it um, and it uses hyperledger technology under, underneath it for the ID solution, but that's not what's relevant. I mean, it, it was really for pensioners just to uh, just to validate their identity, and it was built with pensioners in mind. That it was with with the absolute simplicity as the goal, um, without without really putting the technology uh, in, in a much more muted space. Um, yeah, will will obviously serve dramatically bringing this really even not even thinking about the last mile, but even really towards, you know, mainstreaming it, that it really has uh, a much broader user base. Absolutely. I, I love, you know, the conversation uh, that we're going where, you know, ultimately right down the road, we're not going to be talking about the underlying technology itself, but we're going to be talking about the value um, that these use cases are really bringing to each of the network participants. Um, so one thing actually, and, and I think you guys all touched upon this a little bit um, in the previous conversation uh, with the question. So I'm thinking, of, you know, for, for folks that are looking to start um, a, a blockchain project, some, you know, start working on some of these use cases. Um, in most cases, when you're starting off, you don't necessarily have the unlimited resource, um, so to speak. Right. And so things and issues such as like being able to maintain as well as secure those network might not be something that's on the you know the number one priority when you try to pilot something out. So how can we um, use you know are there various standards are there various guidelines that you would you know recommend how can we um, use what are what is currently out there for folks to use to keep an authority in check that doesn't compromise the integrity of the uh, of the blockchain tech uh, you know DLT um, when you're when you're kind of like um, you know, giving out the ability for someone else to manage your network for you as you're developing some of these things out. I can also rephrase the question. If well, I was just going to open with this. I mean, I it's a it's a very tough question, and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of potential avenues one can go. But the one that I just wanted to share that I thought was very interesting, uh, and and I think might be disruptive in its own way and disruption often doesn't come from the public sector or at least doesn't seem to too but um uh, when well structured it can and there's this the european blockchain services infrastructure looking at creating um this you know sort of a, a public a public infrastructure there yeah, you might then see better you know from a from a competition perspective right like not having just the big incumbents but for much smaller players to jump in to to a, to sort of a, a greater commons. So if the commons can be sort of taken on by, I mean, a, that, that a public or a public private um, sort of consortium that then allows for other things to flourish within that. That a bit was a, the idea of the atrium inside the UN system to have this um, you know consortium that then would allow for other things to flourish. And I think actually also what. Um, sort of other, like a, the, 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 the keys that open that up. I mean, on there, they're looking at self-sovereign identity. And then I think once you can solve that, you can, you're talking about public, public infrastructure, um, you really might open up an incredible, unleash an incredible amount of innovation that can grow uh, on that ecosystem that I think is incredible. I mean, uh, so I think that's even something sort of at maybe at a, at a global level that could be considered um, for, for ways, in, in the same ways we have, open access uh, to, to different technologies that are sort of seen as public goods. Um, and there might be different actors that are providing those services, but you're, you're setting those standards um, so that everyone would have universal access uh, and then uh, in creating that that, um, that is very beneficial, that, that sort of ecosystem where you're optimizing uh, the policy goals you're trying to achieve, which would be sort of that that prosperity that can, that can arise from those, those innovations in a very, in a way that benefits society ultimately.
Yeah, um, I, I could I could jump. I guess as far as let's say getting started, right? Um, you know, if 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 if, if uh, let's say you know some someone's fresh, they're just you know googling around, doing some research. I, I want to get on the um, whether uh, the development side or just want to do some sales for someone that's a blockchain company already out there. Um, I think one of the one of the first aspects is to figure out you know, and this goes to any any sort of uh, uh, job that might be out there, right? What what are some areas that you're passionate about? Um, you know, what what are what are some spaces that you can you can carve out? Whether it's from your own history and background, uh, from your own interests, your own hobbies, uh, and and. and Garden, right, because you you don't want you don't you don't want to get into uh, uh, projects where it's a it's a drag for you to to be there, right? So so I would say you know step one is you know what are, what are you passionate about? What are you interested in? And then you can find different projects uh, uh, within not not only Hyperledger but you know all across the globe and everybody's remote now, right? So you can you you can you can find people who are in your space, um, and then you know you can reach out, right? LinkedIn, um, you can you can look at different uh, uh, maybe it's not a job per se, but you you just want to have some free time on the side where you just contribute to, you know, cold email or something like that. People are always willing to collaborative aspect. People are always willing to, you know, uh, uh, at least it, at least introduce you to what they're what they're working on um, and, and that kind of thing. So I would say, you know, if you're looking to get started, I would say, you know, LinkedIn, figure out what you're passionate about and then, then start reaching out to folks. And then as you move forward, I think what you'll what you'll do is uh, either one, eliminate things that you don't like uh, about about working in the space or, or two, you know, come across things that you're even more interested in. Right. So that, that would be, I guess, my you know one, two cents uh, uh, from that perspective. And also universities are a great resource research projects as well um, and so you can you can do some some googling after after you figure out what your where, where your interest lies what kind of route you want to go down reach out universities and institutions have like great resources as well uh oh I think um Oh, we lost Sean for a second. Yeah. Um, so while we wait for for Sean to join us, um, what Sean was saying is actually a perfect segue um, into kind of the open questions that that we had. Um, one in particular, just to kind of um, you know continue that the, the conversation was you know how can I get started on contributing um, to different existing or you know new uh, blockchain projects, especially focusing on the developing, advising, funding aspects of that. Um, Mark, I actually wanted to kind of feed that question over to you, in particular because of the Unicoin projects that you guys are also um, starting off on this. Could you tell us a little bit about that project and then, you know, ways um, and also kind of lend some insight in ways, you know, you've been an active participant in the Hyperlighter Social Impact SIG for quite a while. Would love to kind of get your perspective on this for, for the audience. Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, of course, the, you know, the, the answer I gave was, was very high level and sort of policy oriented. But I mean, at the individual level, I mean, in the Unicoins project, for example, I mean, it is it is very decentralized. We have no funds. It's a voluntary group inside the UN system through Young UN, um, and and we didn't. We really had to scrabble. I mean, also, I mean, just also in, in how I sort of developed myself into this area. I mean, I also took all the opportunities. But I think forums like uh, the Social Impact Sig um, is is a great place for 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 joint collaboration. Um, I also try. I look at you know, there's different token engineering uh, communities. Um, and also, I think DAOs are looking at how how these are sort of what you can take away from DAOs uh, in looking at these open source uh, communities um, while maintaining the open source part. Because I think often the, the the DAOs, although I was initially extremely excited about it and I'm still a, a huge proponent, um, can ultimately become gated communities. And I think it is about what how your how universal or how accessible and inclusive those communities you're creating are or not. Uh, and sort of to, to know the difference. So I, I try to then tend to look at the ones that are that are very uh, very inclusive, while at the same time having those community standards uh, very similar to Ostrom's principles, as as Hyperledger, for example, has its um, its uh, code of conduct and and other rules that it expects for 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 community participation, which is which is key to make to make those commons uh, viable for the community. But um, yeah, on the unicorns, it is sort of it was an idea around. Uh, fostering that it was a bit inspired by by DAOs or the or the best cases for for them as well as discos which are distributed cooperatives um more from an idea of 
uh, feminist economics that uh, often uh, care work is undervalued and not recognized and not accounted for. Um, and so they were looking at, you know, in, in the Young UN Network, for example, we have, um, as I said, it's, it's managed by volunteers and I work for a volunteer programs. So obviously you're interested in how, how you incentivize and bring people on to a community, um, especially around the care work aspects that is sort of just the work, right? It's, there's not the glamor, there's not, you don't get to put that on your LinkedIn. That really is just the, the, the work that makes the community happen, that, that actually creates that enabling environment for everything uh, to occur. Um, and so there, at least this, this organization, DISCO, that, that is sort of exploring then how to better incentivize that. And their solution is um, providing a separate accounting structure for that, sort of to so noting that there is a difference between sort of the other types of, of uh, work that gets, gets accounted for versus the care work. Moving towards a prototype of unicorns, and unicorns ultimately is supposed to be a token that represents I'm contributing within the UN system for towards the SDGs in a cross-system collaboration because that's what we're trying to incentivize. So, but in our prototype, we're thinking about uh, first prototyping it. We we might be working with the um, an organization that's dealing with uh, emerging uh, female leaders, um, but al also um, and that we've had some interesting discussion with that. And I think that would be a brilliant use case because there's a lot of care work also that takes place in maintaining that eco that community. Um, uh, but also then in the Young UN Network, which also, as I said, requires a lot of care work. But then we also have very substantive tracks, um, which are then you know really working on substantive outputs um, and seeing how the seeing how the accounting system will work out. Just to give a quick example, so we wanted to make sure that uh, we have two models. One of the models is a collaborative model, so people would be having unicorns. Um, they would then this would be their their token as to how much they've contributed to that network. To make it simple, we were going to go back to a certain amount of time of people who've already contributed to the Young UN Network um, to sort of uh, recognize their hours that they've already contributed. And then that would then, with that, with those tokens, um, they would then able to be capitalizing what they value, what they want to see, more, what, what projects or initiatives they want to then capitalize. And then the question would be, as they've capitalized, once let's say a project requires 100 hours, you've capitalized that, 10 people each put in 10 um, unicorns representing the 10 hours that they had already uh, contributed to the system, either for care work or in the substantive tracks. And then um, that might, if you wish to think of it like a DAO, could providing a, a decision-making option, so it would hold a one-tenth share uh, on the um, on the ability to have that, that consortium consensus around then how they will then allocate that. And think of, you can think of this like a project um, of time and then how they will then spend the, that time that they've capitalized um, to achieve what, what, they're, what, what they ultimately, their ultimate goals that they want to um, accomplish. So, uh, and then of course, we also have some other considerations in the white paper, such as providing, dip, this is again, this, these tiered approaches um, and having uh, uh, different user rights. So if you think about very simple user rights, about sort of being able to uh, just uh, participate in the in the economy, meaning you can just offer yourself for um, you know to looking for uh, to providing work, um, or you know do you have the ability to make a proposal, sort of a level up? Um, not only making a proposal, can you clear that proposal? Uh, this is following sort of you know government, uh, public sector clearance processes, but you see this in most organizations, of course, as well. And then uh, you know who can then who can then approve. And if you can have other approvals, uh, so it can be it can be both in the approval rights obligations, who can be the mediators and sort of able to make constitutional sort of structural changes to, to the code and to the consortium rules, uh, as well as then uh, decision making authority. So those are a bit what we're trying to work out in the next step on the prototype. We're, we're looking for volunteers um, to help us with uh, and pro bono actors uh, for anyone who wishes to DM me uh, on that. It's posted on our online volunteering website. Um, and um, this is what we would like to to ultimately prototype because one of the issues that came up when, you, when the, the topic here is driving open collaboration through joint solutioning. It is ultimately a bit what what we were, were seeing as something so the incentive structures or the, stru the, the structures were not ultimately optimizing, or at least that was uh, the view taken by those in the Young UN Network. And um, I think you see this across the board. I think this is ultimately what, what one of the, the promise of consortium blockchains offers. And there will be different models. It, there, as I said, looking at Ostrom's principles, they do need to be 
fit for purpose and fit for those different communities. But there are general high level principles that I think, and that's what I, I, I find so fascinating about this book that I think is highly relevant, at least as a checklist, as looking for what is your community and then really seeing how those principles sort of fit um, while also looking at very analogous uh, communities that you can take it, it insight from both on what they did really well and some of the lessons learned on areas where they could have improved. So um, that's why we want to, of course, prototype this first to sort of work some of those issues out and then uh, and then take it a bit forward and then, of course, iterate accordingly. So I spoke enough on that, so I'll, I'll turn it over to other colleagues to share some insights as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, Alicia, I actually wanted to kind of feed the same question over to you. And we've talked so much about how folks can get involved in, in hyperledger social impact, as well as the various other projects. We'd love to get your perspective and and you know where you see those opportunities lie. Well, I think first of all, any global forum should check out the hyperledger wiki and projects because right now there's an entire page of different projects that are looking for people to contribute for them. I think that's always a really good place to start. And look, at, go to meetups that are related to the topic. There are a lot of meetups now, now most of them are online, which in many ways gives you opportunity to attend events that aren't in your local geographic area. Sometimes it might mean wait in order to attend something in a different time zone. Hello, most of my life. Um, but this and both the issues in that geographic region in that country, but also meet people who are building pe people who are already active in that and make connections, see how you can contribute. Also, as you're there, you're going to learn about different telegram groups, different slack groups. When I go to some of my telegram groups around blockchain and social impact or women in blockchain, I regularly see opportunities posted, some paid, some not paid, depending on the group and depending on the project, where it's not necessarily that they need tech skills. Sometimes they need marketing skills. They need business skills. So if you're coming into the sector free or you're not technical and you still think that this is a technology you want to be in, there are ways to contribute other skill sets. And it's really important to keep that in mind. And there are a lot of different programs, especially for universities. Rutgers University, there's a, a great student-led group within, within the business school. While I do have a degree from Rutgers, um, I met a blockchain and social impact hackathon. And at one point I went over, I was introducing myself to the group and they were looking to, to do something agriculture related. And it turned out we had Rutgers in common. So program with Rutgers are contributing to that. Um, up in Montreal in Canada, McGill University has a food s system program that now is um, very closely involved and is the home of a new working group around interoperability and the semantic web. So if you are a student, definitely look, see what's at your university or any other you have an affiliation with and look at a lot of different places. And right now more than ever, you don't have to be just bound by your geographic area. Look, just go to meetups, go to another city within meetups, go to another country, type in blockchain or type in blockchain and see what comes up because there's always something to learn and it's a great way to find different opportunities. Awesome, thank you so much. So I'm looking at Q&A and I don't see any questions and we have a few more minutes. Um, so if for the folks that are in, you know, listening in, feel free to, to drop us um, and ask a, uh, ask a question, we'd be happy for those. Um, and but I do have one other question. Um, and Sean, maybe uh, I'll, I'll pick on you a little bit for this question. So what advice would you give to someone looking to start a blockchain project? 
Yeah, and and I think I, I got disconnected um, earlier, so I'm not sure I'm not sure where I left off. Uh, so I do apologize about that. Uh, some some rural connections, uh, but but as far as as far as you know, just just starting out, um, you know, like, I, I don't I don't know if you heard my spiel about the passion and the interest uh, that I that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but uh, but yeah, re really focusing on what's gonna what's gonna motivate you to to come in and, and get work done, right? Um, because a, a lot of these projects are you know at, at least initially you know got to be volunteer projects where you're committing your time uh whether it's on you know late at night early in the morning on the weekend whatever it may be um to to try to to, to, to try to just put some sort of contribution forward uh until it the, the project picks up or get some funding or maybe they bring you on the team or whatever it may be um so so you definitely want to make sure that it aligns with your interests and your motivations and then you know i i think that a lot of uh what, what we've mentioned as far as reaching out uh not only by a hyperledger but to universities um, LinkedIn. Oh no, I think we've lost Sean again. A... Oh. <laughs> Just type a question into the chat. Would there be any place to find use cases that are faces? So oh. I think you mean not in phase one of a pilot, but further along. I'd say look at projects in different industries. And one challenge here is small companies don't have the the bandwidth to spend writing them up. They may not have the people they can assign to that. And then when it comes to larger companies or, or to any company indeed, they can't just decide to write up the use case. They also need approval from every company involved. So um, this is where a lot of the use cases are being um, and there are some out there. Thank you for thank you for that, Alicia. And just one other thing to add. Um, so Hyperledger actually has a use case section where a lot of the member organizations are posting about their use cases. Oftentimes, those are actually much more in the develop phases. Um, and usually, they also have contact information for folks that are putting those out. Um, so that's something definitely to, to check in reference. So just you know, type in Hyperledger and then like use cases, and you should be able to find um, PDF documents of the various projects um, that, that, are, that are available using Hyperledger technologies, actually. So it's a great plugin for that. Um, but we're all out of time. Thank you all so much for, for your time today. The panelists really appreciate your time um, waking up at you know the the, the hour that you're you're up at and as well as for the audience really appreciate um, your, your involvement and engagement in this thank you all <laughs>